we're going to be talking about chemistry. We're going to be doing a little bit of a review of chemistry because we need to understand how different molecules interact to make a living being. You know, one way to look at a living thing is a bunch of chemical reactions taking place inside of a body, inside of a cell or a bunch of cells, as the case may be. We call that metabolism. We call that biochemistry. So we need to understand a little bit of the chemistry that you guys should know by now. Here we have a molecule you should be familiar with, sodium chloride, table salt. Sodium chloride, by the fancy name, well, it's made of one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. And what you should notice right away is that the properties of sodium and chlorine are much different than the properties of table salt. Sodium itself is a metal, a toxic metal, and chlorine, well, all metals are toxic, hopefully you guys aren't eating metal, sodium, which is a metal, and chlorine, which is a poisonous gas, when those atoms interact, they give you sodium chloride, an ionic compound, which is delicious and less toxic than chlorine gas. Um, molecules, you understand how molecules are formed. When atoms interact, um, we say that the interaction between the atoms is a chemical bond. And most molecules are formed by sharing of electrons between two or more atoms or um, the transfer of electrons between two or more atoms. So we need to focus on three kinds of bonds for this course, namely covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, and ionic bonds. So what is a covalent bond? A covalent bond is formed when two atoms share a pair of valence electrons, electrons in their outer shell. In this example here, we have two hydrogen atoms, and when they share their electrons, we get a molecule of H2, okay? And this is called a covalent bond. Covalent bonds, um, you, uh, you could have two atoms that share more than one pair of electrons. All right, so if you share one pair of electrons, you have a single bond. If you share two pairs of electrons, you have a double bond. When oxygen, you see that here, when two atoms of oxygen interact, they form a double bond. Okay, we're going to see a lot of double bonds in some of the biochemistry that we're going to be looking at very soon. Um, some of the consequences of the formation of these atoms. Well, here we see up here, covalent bond between two hydrogen atoms. But if we go to another molecule you guys are familiar with, H2O, H2O, water. Now water is interesting because hydrogen and oxygen, they form covalent bonds, so that's the H2O you're familiar with. But what's interesting about oxygen is that it is more electronegative than hydrogen atoms. What does that mean? It means that the electrons are going to spend more time around the oxygen atom than it will around the hydrogen atoms. What does that mean? Well, electrons carry a negative charge, so if they're going to spend more time on this end of the molecule here, then this end of the molecule is going to be more negative, and this end of the molecule is going to be more positive. So water ends up being a polar molecule. It has a negative end and a positive end, and the reason why it's polar is because one end is more electronegative than the others. Another common um, electronegative atom that you'll be seeing um, in biochemistry is nitrogen. Okay, We have a lot of nitrogen in our bodies, and nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon or hydrogen. So it has an electronegative effect as well. All right. Now, because water is polar, it can form hydrogen bonds with other atoms, particularly other, sorry, other molecules, other molecules like other molecules of water, for example. So a hydrogen bond forms when the partial negative charge of one oxygen atom in a water molecule interacts with the partial positive charge of hydrogen in an adjacent molecule. Well, what do we call this? We call this a hydrogen bond. Okay, again, these are usually going to be formed when you have nitrogen or oxygen present with carbon and um, hydrogen. Okay, um, you guys are familiar with the term ions. I hope so. An ion is a molecule that carries a charge. 
okay? And it can be positively charged, we call those cations, or it can be negatively charged, we call those anions. And as you know, probably from grade one, is that uh, opposites attract. A negative charge is going to attract a positive charge. And the interaction that results is called an ionic bond. Sodium chloride is such a bond. If you're gonna look here, you'll see that sodium has a positive charge, sorry for that ugly circle, and chlorine has a negative charge. So they're going to interact together and what you get? Sodium chloride, table salt, which we see down here. It's a crystal, right? I don't think that's table salt, would you? Okay, compounds could be inorganic or organic. Okay, so inorganic and organic. Well, I should probably start with organic. Organic actually means anything that contains carbon. Okay, so a carbon-based molecule is organic. It's not like what we hear about you know, in grocery stores and on the news. Um, organic just means with, with, with carbon. And inorganic, of course, are things that do not contain carbon. So organic molecules are going to include carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. These are the four molecules we're going to be learning about in the next uh, three or four lectures. And inorganic uh, molecules that are very important to life are going to include water, salts, and certain acids or bases. Okay, Water is the most important inorganic compound in life because a cell is usually going to be 60 to 80 percent water. So why is water so important? Why have living things um, evolved to uh, rely so much on water? So a high heat of vaporization this is very important of course right it means that um, it takes a lot of energy before um, the temperature of water changes and of course a high amount of energy is required to vaporize it right so we don't vaporize the moment the temperature goes up by a few degrees i hope hope it hasn't happened to you um, high heat of vaporization high heat capacity well this relates to homeostasis of course as well right your body needs to maintain a certain constant temperature throughout so because water resists these changes due to changes in temperature um, it is um, the the solution for most of the chemical reactions that are taking place in your cells that are taking place in your body okay hydrophilic and hydrophobic remember these words um, they're going to come up a lot something that's hydrophilic Water loving means it will dissolve in water readily. Ionic compounds like salt will dissolve in water. This is um, um, something you're probably familiar with. You can go try it out if you don't believe me. Dissolve some salt in water. It's quite easy. Nonpolar molecules are hydrophobic. Okay, you could probably name some hydrophobic compounds. Lipids. Lipids include fats and oils. What happens when you put oil in water? Well, the oil will kind of float to the top because it's not going to dissolve in water. They're going to aggregate with other nonpolar molecules, mostly whatever other oil is already there. Okay, very reactive. Water can be used to cushion. And from an ecological point of view, it's very important that water floats when it's frozen. Okay, water is an odd compound insofar as it's less dense when it's um, frozen. Um, the molecules form a kind of a crystal lattice, they call it, which keeps the other water molecules at a particular distance from each other. So this crystal structure that's formed, this lattice, is less dense because the water molecules are all being held at a particular distance from each other. So ice floats on water, and this is very important for um, different types of ecology. Um, that we'll be studying towards the end of the semester. Cohesion, well, water molecules are going to stick together. They have a high surface tension. So here you see a creepy looking spider. Well, it's kind of cute, but maybe you're afraid of spiders. But there it is, a water strider um, standing on water because it has a high surface tension. Uh, surely animals like these appreciate that property of water, but it's very important for plants. The fact that water is very cohesive it means that plants can draw water through their um, uh, vascularization a lot easier right so you've seen you've seen plants trees different plants they need to draw water up from the ground draw them up to uh, their leaves and their branches that are very high well this is um, helped along by cohesion 
All right, so water. You knew water was very important. Have you ever heard that life on Earth is carbon-based? Carbon-based? You know that carbon is an atom, presumably. Um, most of the uh, molecules um, in your body are carbon-based. So when I talk about proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, these are all carbon-based molecules. Okay, and all life on Earth is carbon-based. If you're a science fiction nerd, you've probably heard that theoretically, silicone-based life has been theorized by certain uh, science fiction authors. Well, why is that? Because silicone and carbon, they can form four stable bonds, making them very versatile atoms, meaning they can form many different types of compounds, many different types of molecules. So when we look at carbon's versatility, well, here we see one example of how versatile carbon could be. It's just forming a long chain, octane, right? Just a long chain of eight carbons flanked by hydrogen. High energy molecule, by the way. This is why it can be used as a fuel. Here's glucose. Well, this is also used as a fuel, but it's used as a fuel mostly in living organisms. Okay, six glucose molecules. This is called a carbohydrate. It's flanked by hydrogens and hydroxyls. We'll learn what those words mean in the next lecture, in the next video. Okay, now carbon, when we say it's carbon, life is carbon-based or most of these molecules are carbon-based, what we mean is we can form a kind of a, a skeleton, if you will, of carbon molecules, and you can attach different functional groups onto those skeleton, onto this skeleton. So what does that mean? Well, different functional groups have different properties from other functional groups. Okay, so here's one functional group. We call it an amino group. You guys have heard of amino acids. Amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. All right, so all amino acids have an amino group and a carboxyl group. Carboxyl group. Okay, these are two different functional groups on a carbon skeleton. Okay, here in your notes you have a list of different functional groups um, so what macromolecules do we study um, proteins carbohydrates lipids and nucleic acids sorry if I sound like a broken record what I want to explain to you now is the idea that most of these are polymers proteins carbohydrates and nucleic acids they can form polymers well so a polymer what is a polymer okay a polymer is a chain made from repeating molecules, repeating molecules which we call monomers. So we talked briefly about amino acids, correct? Now an amino acid um, is one kind of a molecule that we found in proteins. Now let's say that these monomers down here in this figure at the bottom, let's say each one of these represents an amino acid. If we join together different amino acids in a chain, well those amino acids, those monomers, form a polymer. And that polymer is what we call a uh, polypeptide, okay? And the polymerization of a molecule occurs through reactions that we call condensation reactions. Why do we call them condensation reactions? Condensation refers to water. So whenever two monomers are joined together, the reaction produces one water molecule. What if we wanted to break this down? Well, then we would need a hydrolysis reaction. Try and break this down. It looks like a complicated word, but hydro, water. Lysis is a word you're going to see a lot in biology, so you may as well learn it now. Anyway, anytime you see L-Y-S or L-Y-T, lysis or lytic, it refers to something that's breaking. So hydrolysis means breaking with water. If you look down here at the bottom of this diagram, well, here is a polymer, many repeating subunits of a molecule. Okay, here is a water molecule. The water molecule is going to interact with this hydrogen bond and break one of the monomers off of the chain. Okay, up here we're forming a polymer. Here's one monomer. Okay, here's another monomer at the end of a chain. When these molecules react, okay, you see here HO, they form one water molecule and the chain has just been lengthened plus one. We're gonna see that a little more when we go on to proteins later on. So, we'll take a little break. I'll see you in part two of the lecture. We will look at carbohydrates.